Here I built two structures uh, with just different colored spheres of them. I've got a carbon in the center, yellow, blue, red, and green around them. The question I want to start with is, are these the same or are these different? So I've drawn them up on the board in three-dimensional. This is what they look like. The question is, are they the same or are they different? And with all isomers, the question is, some of both. So these are the same. They have the same five things bonded together. All of, both of them have all four things connected to the carbon, so they're the same connectivity, but they're also different. And it turns out that if I were to manipulate these and move these around, you would be able to see that a little bit. Like for instance, if I put the yellow and the green so that those are with each other, the red and the blue become opposing one another. And if I flip that around so that the red and the blue are in the same spots, then the yellow and the green become in opposite spots. And there's no way for me to take this one that I'm holding in my right hand and this one in my left hand and put them so that they are the exact same thing. So the term for that is non-superimposable. And what that term means is that I can't put one on top of the other and put it in some rotation so that it is exactly the same as the other. So we have compound one and compound two, and so they're not the same, they're non-superimposable. If they're the same thing, I should be able to pick it up and put it on top of one another. Okay? But there's also a lot of similarities, and if you haven't noticed this yet, if you put a mirror up in between the two, one is the reflection of the other. So these are non-superimposable mirror images. Okay. And there's two, two terms that we use for that. One is called chiral. Chiral means you're, uh, you have a non-superimposable mirror image. And enantiomers are the two things that have non-superimposable mirror images. So we use both these terms pretty, pretty loosely surrounding these two. Now, how do we distinguish them? How do I distinguish number one from number two? If I take these and I throw them up in the air and I mix them around and I come back later, how do I know which one was one and how would I know which one is two? So it's tricky because I can move myself in any location and space around this. So I have to be able to kind of pick a way to describe them. And so what I do is I assign priorities. So I made up priorities, but normally priorities for elements are dictated by atomic number. The bigger the atomic number, the bigger the priority. So I put blue is the biggest atomic number, four is the lowest. So four is hydrogen or something close to that, and one is iodine or something very large in atomic number. So what I can do then is I can take each of these, let's see, this one is, this one is this one. Nope, no, 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 sorry. There we go. So this is compound one. And the way that I can come up with a designation for them is I need to move compound one from this orientation so that four is facing away from me. So I want my eye to be going down the line from carbon to priority four. Okay, when I do that, it looks like this. So I'm gonna redraw number one down here. So number one has the carbon in the middle. It's got the blue coming down here, green coming down here, and the yellow going up. Okay, and then I'm gonna label those priorities. So priority one, priority two, priority three. And then I'm gonna see, I'm gonna go from one to two to three. And when I do that, I'm moving in a counterclockwise rotation. So therefore we give this the label S for sinister, or left-handed, and that is counterclockwise. So in the second one, I'm gonna put this one down, put up the second one. I wanna do the same thing. So I wanna position myself so I'm kind of behind the board, looking down at the carbon through the red. It's easier to move this for me. So when I do that, I have my carbon in the middle. Compound two, I have the green going up. I have the blue coming down to the left, and the yellow down to the right. So again, I label my priorities, priority one, priority two, priority three, and when I do that, I move in a clockwise rotation, and that gives us the orientation of R. So R and S are used to distinguish between two enantiomers for a compound that is chiral. Okay, so, so here's, the, here's the front image of that. So what I'm doing is I'm orienting myself, in this case, I'm putting my eye over here so that it stares down through the carbon into priority four here. On this one, I had to put my eye so that it was oriented down through the carbon all the way to priority four. And then I looked to see that when I stared that way, I would go from priority one to two to three. So in this case, I'm looking at the S rotation. And in this case, I'm going priority one to two to three. So I'm doing a clockwise rotation. And so this is the R configuration. 
So it's a way for me to track which enantiomer I'm looking at. Now, how do the R and the S enantiomers differ? So keep in mind, a lot of alkenes are the same. They're made of the same materials. They are connected the same. The only difference is their, is their position in three-dimensional space, right? So, so the differences are very slight. And so there's two things that are important. They can react or interact with other chiral compounds differently. And a rather unfortunate example of this is there was a drug developed for uh, nausea medication during pregnancy, and one of the enantiomers helped with uh, nausea, and the other one uh, was uh, something that caused defects, birth defects. Uh, so they, they can interact with biological systems are often chiral, and so they can have that. And a good example of that is your hands, right? Your hands are good examples of non-superimposable mirror images. Your hands are chiral, you have an enantiomer one, an enantiomer two. So you can't put your right hand on your left hand or your left hand on your right hand, but there are mirror images of each other ignoring freckles and nails and little defects. Uh, they are very good examples of this. So if you get other chiral things, like you get gloves that are, that are obviously sided, you know, like you have a back and a front of the glove, you're not gonna be able to put your left hand in your right glove, okay? Because that's not gonna interact with something else that's chiral in the same way. And the other interesting thing is that R and S enantiomers will interact with what's called plain polarized light. And so one of these two enantiomers will cause a rotation of the plane of polarized light in one direction, and the other one will cause a rotation of plane polarized light in the opposite direction. Now, what plane polarized light would be a whole nother video, but, but to briefly uh, bring that up is, is that we can measure that very easily. So there's an instrument called a polarimeter. And this measures that rotation. Okay, so one of these two will cause that to rotate clockwise, not necessarily the R form, the other one will cause it to rotate uh, counterclockwise, and that's something that's determined experimentally, but we can use that to determine whether we have the same amounts of both, whether we have more of one than the other, which one we have, and so there's some more terms that come up with that. So, so one term is optically active, and a chiral compound is optically active, and then it causes this rotation of plane polarized light. If we have both enantiomers present in equal amounts, that's called a racemic mixture, So if I have, you know, 25 particles of this and 25 particles of that, that's a racemic mixture. Now, the, the S form will cause a rotation of light in one direction, the R form will, will reverse that rotation, and so we'll end up with no uh, net not optical activity because the two will cancel from both enantiomers in that chiral compound. Okay. So this is a good way to start with R and S uh, and, and kind of the uh, go through and say, what is chiral, what are enantiomers? The idea is we're looking at how are these differing from each other and how are they the same, and then using that to kind of construct our, our definitions of what these are. So for a couple more tips on RNS, here we'll do a couple quick examples. In this compound, we're trying to figure out whether it's RS. We first assign priority, we have priority four, priority one, priority two, and priority three. In this case, we've got carbons attached to both, but if we continue out from there, there's another carbon attached here, which is a tie break over the hydrogen. So this gets priority. So we want to orient ourselves kind of over here. So we're facing through the carbon into here. And when we do that, we see a one, a two, and a three, which is a clockwise rotation. And therefore, this is assigned R. That's the R enantiomer of that chiral compound. And then over here, here we have a problem because for, in order to orient ourselves, we'd have to go behind the board and look at it, which you can do. You can sit there and kind of reposition yourself in your head and go, okay, I'm looking at one, two, and three. So I'm looking and I'm going one, I'm going one, two, three, and then figure out from there what you're doing. So to me, that looks like an S, but that's hard to do. So an easy thing you can know is that anytime you swap two, you will convert from the R to the S or from the S to the R. So if I put the hydrogen here 
and I redraw this. So I have carbon, bromine, iodine. But I flip flop the hydrogen and the chlorine. And this is going to be the, the other enantiomer of whatever I had previously. And this is going to be much easier to see. So I have one, two, three. So I see a clockwise rotation. That's the R form, which means this must be the S form, which is what we had come up with earlier. So therefore we're good. But that's a good trick in case you end up with one that's really hard to do. You can always take one if you have a hydrogen kind of in the plane and it's hard to see, or the fourth priority in the plane. You can always switch to. The other thing you can do is just try and redraw it. So like maybe come and put your eye here and then look at what's to the left and to the right and use that to reconfigure them.